Imagine a classic Pokemon game, but open world. That is exactly what we're playing today. Pokemon Crystal Clear is a ROM hack of Pokemon Crystal, but it's better in so many ways. From 30 different starters to choose from, all 16 gyms available at the very start of the game, and so much more. In this video, we'll be spending 24 hours in Pokemon Crystal Clear. As almost all of my other playthrough videos, I have some goals I'd like to complete during this playthrough. First off, I want to get at least 10 badges. That is two more than the traditional eight, but I'm not entirely sure if we can get all 16 in one video on top of all the other goals we've set. Secondly, I want a full team of shiny Pokemon. The odds of finding a shiny Pokemon in this game are 1 in 8192, but this game has a bunch of amazing features, including its own shiny hunting method which I'll get into later in the video. Third, I want to buy a house. Believe it or not, this game has a functional housing system where you can purchase different properties across the Kanto and Johto region and even customize the interior. And the last goal is I want to find a shiny legendary Pokemon. There are a total of nine different legendary Pokemon in this game, 11 if you count the mythicals. I want to find at least one of them in its shiny form. This game has plenty to offer in terms of content with a huge list of new areas to explore, old areas that are updated and changed, and you can catch every single Pokemon from both generation 1 and 2 in this game, so it's gonna be pretty easy to lose track of time. With that being said, let's jump right into this. First off, the starter selection. Like I mentioned before, there are 30 different starter Pokemon to choose from. You have the standard Bulbasaur, Charmander, and Squirtle, Totodile, Cyndaquil, and Chikorita, but then you have other options like Eevee, Pikachu, Growlithe, Psyduck, and so many more. I decided to go with Eevee, but I do a bunch of soft resets until I eventually get a shiny one. I accidentally didn't nickname it, and I forgot about the name raider in this generation. Because I had already made this choice here, none of the Pokemon are going to have nicknames. However, you guys can leave comments for nickname suggestions, and if this video does well and we do a part 2, I'll pick nicknames from the comments and give them to our Pokemon. I decided to start in Goldenrod City in Johto, since the bug catching contest is just north of there, and that is a great way to get a quick and easy additional team member. However, the first thing I do is head underground to get my Eevees fur groomed, which will increase its happiness. By absolutely no surprise, I want to evolve this Eevee into an Espeon, which is my favorite evolution. And to do that, we need to get our friendship level to 220. A couple trainers stand in the way before I do that, however Eevee can handle their Pokemon since all trainers at this point will have pretty low level Pokemon. Trainer Pokemon levels scale based off how many badges you have, and since we have none, the levels scale from levels 1 to 4 with the odd Pokemon being a little bit higher. We also grab the coin case, as this will help us later. I figure we might as well fight all of the trainers here to get some easy XP, and we run into this guy who has 4 Pokemon. He leads with a Magnemite, which is a Steel type Pokemon, and this means all of our attack damage will be halved since we only have normal Moves and they're a steel type. We take out the first Pokemon and he sends out a Voltorb which is level 7. We thankfully do take it out and we level up to level 7 ourselves and we get prompt to learn the move Sand Attack which is absolutely clutch but I did accidentally get rid of Tackle by mashing the A button so now all we have is Flail which is a pretty weak move that goes up in power the less HP the user has. This trainer then sends out another Magnemite so I spam Tail Whips and Sand Attacks until my Flails can actually do some damage and eventually we take that out as well and then he sends out yet another Magnemite. We do the same strategy and eventually we take it out but I was not expecting such a stressful battle so early on. Losing a battle isn't the end of the world, it will just faint and go back to the Pokemon Center. However, when a Pokemon faints, its friendship level is lowered. We want to avoid dying as much as humanly possible. After that rough battle, we rush to the Pokemon Center to heal up our Eevee. I then head to the game corner to look at the rewards and I notice that we can buy a Master Ball for 7,500 coins. I check the list of Pokemon and there are plenty of cool Pokemon here which I will keep in mind for later. I talk to all the NPCs to see if any of them will give me some free coins like in the old Gains, but nobody can spare some change. After we head to the Goldenrod department store to pick up Pokeballs and potions, I remember that we can get an odd egg in this game if we head south of where we currently are to the daycare. However, these eggs take absolutely forever to hatch in these games, so I'm not expecting a new team member anytime soon. I also checked the Pokedex and noticed it has been completely changed. You can see all the wild encounters in your current area. You can see every possible move a Pokemon can learn from level up, TM, egg moves, and even move tutors. Oh, also, Pokemon can follow you in this game. Such a small feature that is an absolute fan favorite. I battle a bunch of more trainers, getting Eevee up a couple of levels, and then I head to the bug catching contest. Contest. This is a contest to see which trainer can catch the strongest bug type Pokemon in National Park. This contest also makes a lot of more rare bug Pokemon spawns such as Pinsir, Aerocross, and even some fully evolved bugs too like Beedrill and Ariados. I run around the grass for a little bit just to see what I can find, and I end up encountering a level 16 Ariados and decide to catch it just in case I black out, that way I have a Pokemon I can use in the contest. We end up finding a wild fortress, but given that the Ariados had already weakened me down a little bit, I just threw a ball and hoped for the best. 
I tried. We get taken out and the bud catching contest is over. We play second and get another stone, which is kind of pointless because our EV was already holding one. We do, however, get to keep the Aridos that we caught, so now we have another Pokemon added to our team. I run just outside the park and grab a couple extra items sitting around when I spot this Snorlax sleeping in the trees. I don't have any way to wake it up yet, so I'll have to come back for this later. I head south to the Ilex Forest where you can get the TM Headbutt, which not only is a strong normal type move that Eevee can learn, but it allows you to headbutt trees and find wild Pokemon. So naturally, I taught Eevee Headbutt, and in the first tree I headbutted, we found a wild Scyther. I absolutely love Scizor, so I need to catch this Pokemon. After throwing almost every ball I had, we finally caught it. We then make it to Azalea Town, and I head up to Kurt's house since he can craft Pokeballs from Apricorns, and he mentions something about a forest protector, and how I should go talk to Professor Oak for more information. After walking out of Kurt's house, I notice a Slowpoke sleeping on top of the gym, and as I explore the town more, there are slow pokes all over the place. I get a prompt to call Randy, and I'm like, who the hell is Randy? He offers to sell me this house for 20,000 poke dollars. I'm broke, so I decline. I then spot this whooper in the grass, and I approach it, and to my surprise, it's a child. He starts the battle with a shiny Zubat? which is a pretty cool thing to see, but Eevee takes it out in one turn. Next, he sends out what I'm assuming is his starter Pokemon Totodile. Eevee also one-shots that. And then by no surprise, he sends out a Wooper of his own and then proceeds to call me mean. For defeating him, he gives me three rare candies and tells us that his parents got him a Wooper costume. Interesting. I look into the settings and I notice that you can change a bunch of music from wild battles to gym leader fights and even the bicycle theme. This might just be the absolute best feature added to this game. Just listen to this. Since I stopped recording right here, I picked up the game the next day and decided to go back to the national park with a specific target in mind. In these games, you can find a lot more bug types in the national park during a bug catching contest. One of these Pokemon is a Scizor. I know I just caught a Scyther, but the evolution method was still the same and you have to trade it holding a metal coat. There is an NPC in this game called the trade back guy who will trade you back exactly what you trade to him, but I didn't know that. But now I have to explain something. I played this on a Game Boy Advanced emulator and a common feature in most emulators is the speed up feature. Like its name suggests, it will speed up the game. Now when you begin the bug catching contest, you only have 20 minutes to catch a bug type and then that's over. So I figured I would use the speed up feature until the 20 minutes in game had been reached and then turn it off. That way my in game time wasn't affected. However, after successfully finding a scissor and catching it, I went to leave for the bug catching contest and it said I still had 11 minutes left. So I assumed that only 9 minutes had passed. Then, after winning the bug catching contest, receiving a sunstone as a reward and adding scissor to our party, I went to save the game and it said I had 3 hours and 15 minutes on my save file. But the game said I only spent 9 minutes in the bug catching contest and it did not take me 90 minutes to get from the Ilex Forest to National Park. So the save file time is wrong, but I have a way to make it right, which I will do later in the video. But up until that point, the hour clock is based off of my recording links and estimates, so it might be off by a little bit. You'll understand why I'm telling you this later in the video. After hitting what should have been the start of the third hour, our team of Eevee, Egg, Ariados, and Scizor I ventured all the way to Blackthorn City. Claire is the gym leader of the city who specializes in dragon type Pokemon, and I decide this should be the first gym we take down. We head inside and whoa, this is different. Way more fitting. At this point, our starter Pokemon Eevee is nearing level 20, and I realized I may have overleveled a little bit. Granted, I didn't really go out of my way to train on other Pokemon other than at the very start of this video. Remember earlier when I mentioned changing music for battles? Well, I changed the gym music to the Sword and Shield gym music, but in a Gen 2 style, and it goes hard. Since this gym is at a first gym badge stage, Claire's team is just three Dratini and a Horsey. Eevee one shot all of them. We get our first badge, and Claire's actually matured since Pokemon Crystal, since she doesn't throw a fit about losing it. We step outside, and the Pokemon League calls us to recognize that we received our first gym badge. I try to figure out how to get to the Dragons then without Surf, couldn't figure it out. But I did later find out that it actually is possible for those of you who are wondering. I headed in Mount Mortar, and after a bit of exploring, I see an exit and head towards it. On the outside, we reach Mount Mortar Peaks, a new place added in this ROM hack, and I decide to go check the grass to see what wild Pokemon we can find, and we find a Mareep. 
so we catch her and add her to our team. I do a bit more exploring in the mountains, finding a couple items, and I come across this Togepi just walking around. I encounter it, and it's only level 5. I was really excited until I remembered that Togekiss wasn't released until Gen 4, so I killed the little baby egg. I see a cave entrance, and curiosity got the best of me. I head towards it, and I find a bunch of Togepi just chilling outside. And I head into the cave, and we reach this area with its own grass patch, its own music, and absolutely no wild Pokemon. I wonder what the point of this place is. I decide to leave, and our odd egg hatches into an Elekid. I know I haven't been given Pokemon nicknames, but I had to name this one L Ekid because I didn't want it. I go back to exploring the mountains, looking for more potential team members and rare items, and I come across a Lucky Egg. This item gives Pokemon boosted XP for every battle, and will help out a huge amount when trying to grind levels. I also spot this journal that is tattered and is hard to read, but it mentions something about roaming legendaries, so I'm assuming it's referring to the legendary dogs. I decide it's time to go get our second gym badge, as most of the trainer's Pokemon are half the level of our own starter. After a bit of thinking, I make the decision to stand up to our bully and challenge Whitney and her Miltank, everyone's worst nightmare. But what scared me even more was doing other gym badges, which would result in Whitney's gym badge being even harder to get. After taking on the trainers in her gym, we begin our second gym badge battle. We lead with Eevee and she leads with Clefairy, who gets taken out easily. Now the real trouble. We get hit with an attract, which gives us a chance to not hit her Pokemon. We do however hit through it, and hit a headbutt twice. But now it's started. The rollouts. We can't hit our next headbutt because of infatuation, and this happens for the next three turns. So I decide to swap into an L I kid to give us a safe swap into Scizor. I then realize that Scizor has no good moves. So I just leer her mill tank before going down the next turn. Mareep comes out and also gets one shot by rollout. Ariados comes out and gets hit with a track instead of rollout. Thank God. We hit mill tank with a poison sting and get the luckiest poison of our life. Ariados goes down and Eevee comes back out. Mill tank goes for rollout but mill Misses, and we hit it with a charm, partially lowering its attack stat. And using charm actually caused us to be able to tank a stomp, which eventually leads to Miltank's demise as it dies from poison, earning us our second gym badge. Although Claire has matured, Whitney has not, and she cries about losing before having one of the gym trainers stop us from leaving without the gym badge we earned. The Pokemon League calls us and tells us they've acknowledged our second gym badge. I then go and grab the Squirt Bottle, which we will probably never use, heal up at the Pokemon Center, and make our way over to Violet City to take on Faulkner. The flying gym leader. Mareep handles the trainers with absolute ease and evolves into a Flaffy right before we take on Faulkner. Perfect timing. We once again jam out to this amazing tune, and that's sadly the most interesting thing about this battle. Faulkner's team is just two Pidgeotos. Flaffy takes down the first one, and I send out Eevee to deal with the second one, since gym battles boost friendship levels. After that, the Pokemon League registers our third gym badge, and mentions Professor Elm, and how he's known for his generosity. Hearing this, we kill up at the Pokemon Center, bench a Lek kid, and head right over to New Bark Town. Turns out, he just gives us a Togepi. I was kinda hoping for a starter. We head east to Route 27, which leads to the Kanto region, and fight a couple of trainers on the way, causing Causing our Eevee to evolve into the lovely green shiny Espeon. I remember reading online that if you interact with Professor Elm's computer, it will register the Gen 2 starters in your Pokédex, and since this game has the best Pokédex system I have ever seen, I can go find that Gen 2 starter I wanted, Totodile. It says in the Pokédex that Totodile is a 10% spawn in the forest area of the Safari Zone, so I head all the way to the Kanto region, entering from the League Gate and reaching Viridian City. I head south to see if there's a bridge connecting the south end of Kanto, but no luck. Since I was in Pallet Town, however, I decide to stop at Professor Oak's lab and see what he has to say. He mentions the protector of the Alex Forest, but says we must defeat him in battle before he can let us in on the secret. I decide against it, as I really want a Totodile and we desperately need a water type on our team. So I travel north towards Stiglitz Tunnel, which can be found just outside of Pewter City, we pass through it, reaching Vermilion City. We head east to Route 11, and eventually reach Route 12, where thankfully there is no Snorlax blocking our path to Fuchsia City. We stop at this guy's house, and he gives us the old fishing rod, so now we can fish if we please. After reaching Route 13, our Togepi egg hatches into a Togepi. Who would have thought? We fight a couple trainers on the way, including this guy who has six Pikachus. Really. We eventually reach Fuchsia City, and I rush to the Pokemon Center to box our Togepi and heal up our team since we had to go through four different routes. We head to the Safari Warden's house, and his daughter tells us that we can steal stuff from him, but we were only able to find the HM for Surf. I was hoping for some blackmail material, 
but this will do I suppose. I also spot this house with a backyard, but since we're still broke, I step away from it. You can spot various wild Pokemon here in Future City, such as Kangaskhan, Snorlax, Lapras, Gyarados, and this cool looking Onyx, who I all add to my Pokedex in case I want to catch one for myself later. We enter the Safari Zone, and in this game, you can use your own Pokemon and items in the Safari Zone. No more Safari Balls and Bait. I spend a lot of time here looking to see what kind of Pokemon I can find. I then realize I won't be able to find Totodile from a surfing encounter without a Pokemon to surf on. So I finished up a Chinchou and taught her surf so we can begin our hunt for Totodile. After about 20 minutes, we finally find what we're looking for and eventually we catch it. We do some more exploring in the Safari Zone to see if we can find any other cool items or rare Pokemon. Oh, it's you. I decide that I want to catch a Chansey and spend about 40 minutes looking for Chansey, but we do eventually find one and catch it. Since I was in the area, I go and challenge the Fuchsia City Gym. Janine is the leader in this generation and is a poison type user. Her team consisted of a Golbat, Spinarak, Venonat, and two Coughing. Naturally, Aspion swept the entire gym. However, it is cool to see all the different gym leaders' teams based off the current badge count. The Pokemon League rings our phone and registers our fourth gym badge. I want to go challenge the Grass type gym in Celadon City and planned on using Scizor's bug type moves to basically sweep the gym, but then I realized Scizor doesn't learn any good bug moves. Twin Needle and Fury Cutter. That's it. But I decided to leave and find this weird looking NPC out in the grass who challenges us to a battle. He had a Porygon 2 and a shiny Togepi. After sending out his Togepi, he says, Time to bring out the big guns. I have never been more intimidated in my life. I then head north to Cerulean City where the trainer tells its Slowbro to use Confusion and it jumps on the roof. Curious to see if the Cerulean Cave had lower level wild Pokemon, we head over there and the first thing I find was a level 40 Golbat, so we dipped immediately. I went back to Route 7 in search of a new team member by the name of Houndour, and we found one, but it fled using Roar. We found another one and killed it with a crit. Third time's the charm, however, and we did finally catch one. After catching it, we leave Kanto and go all the way back to National Park to train up our Houndor, since the bug catching contest happens every day in this game, and you can find some high level wild bug types to train on. I had no luck at all finding anything worth training, so I left shortly after. We head towards Blackthorn City once more, since we have Surf now, we can get into the Dragon's Den. We find the HM for Whirlpool just chilling on the ground, teach it to Totodile, pass through the Whirlpool blocking the way to this place. I don't even know what this place is called, but it's in the Dragon's Den and it's where you get the gift Dratini, so. After answering some questions, we get our Dratini and we get prompted to save the game for soft resetting, which is exactly what I do. Remember how earlier I mentioned the in-game save time being wrong? It is, but we can make up for it. Since soft resetting takes real time, not save file time, I can spend that 90 minutes that was incorrectly placed on my save file when I was using the speed up earlier to soft reset for a shiny Dratini. This way I can soft reset for a shiny while still being able to add time to the 24 hour clock. After about 40 minutes, we find our shiny Dratini. Even though I lost 90 minutes from the speedup, we still got around 40 minutes off that timer, which is still better than nothing. I did some exploring on the outer parts of the Dragon's Den, and I ended up in the Forest of Rage. Truth be told though, I didn't find anything really interesting here. Eventually we do escape the Forest of Rage and make it to the Lake of Rage. After battling a couple of trainers, I head south towards Mahogany Town, and in one of the route connectors, there was a room with a bunch of swine up everywhere. And even a trainer who said they would trade me a swine up for literally any Pokemon, which I thought was pretty funny. We head west towards a critic city where I decide to take on the gym leader Morty, who specializes in ghost type Pokemon. I switch trained Dratini and had Houndour deal with all of the gym trainers, causing him to evolve right before the gym battle. Morty's team consisted of two Haunter, a Mistrevis, and a Gengar. Similar to his original team, but to be fair, there aren't many ghost type Pokemon in the first two generations of Pokemon. Once again, the Pokemon League calls us after winning our gym badge. One of the many great features in this game is the ability to rebattle gym leaders, even at different difficulty levels based off of your gym badge count. I faced off against Morty a second time just to switch train Dratini a bit more and get a couple more levels on Houndoom before taking on the Kimono Girls. Truth be told, I thought this is how you got Fly, and all we did was get the Clear Bell, which is better than nothing, but the Clear Bell is used to summon Lugia, and that's nice, but that's nowhere near as convenient as having Fly. I then took the Go Train back to Kanto and decided to take on Erika, the grass type gym leader. Just like the last gym, we switched train Dratini and Houndoom took care of all the gym trainers. Now comes Erika. Espeon and Houndoom make quick work of her four Pokemon. Tangela, Blossom, Skipbloom, and Victory Bell. Most of the fights from here forward will be switch training Dratini as it doesn't fully evolve into level 55 and there isn't a modern XP share in this game. After yet another quick phone call with the Pokemon League, we head to the department store to buy a bunch of Pokeballs and TMs for our Pokemon. I then travel to the most northern point of Kanto, above Cerulean, and I noticed a ledge on a mountain. So I surfed over and followed the trail which led to a cave. Curiosity got the best of me, and after a bit of exploring, I found nothing. But I did find this blue swine up named Blink. 
I wasn't convinced that there was absolutely nothing in this cave, so I headed even deeper, and I found a wild Lapras and tried to catch it, but after 20 minutes, I gave up. I then went to Celadon City and took on yet another gym leader, Sabrina, who specializes in psychic type Pokemon. Houndoom, who is a dark type, absolutely mopped the floor at this gym. Sabrina surprisingly only had 3 Pokemon considering it's supposed to be at the 7th gym badge difficulty. She had an Espeon, a Mr. Mime, and an Alakazam. And to absolutely no surprise, Houndoom one shot her entire team. After receiving our 7th gym badge, we head north of Cerulean City to catch a ferry, which takes us to Fuchsia City, and I surfed over to Cinnabar Island. This place also got a makeover. I head into this building, and I find this guy who says he'll recover fossils, and I remember that there's a fossil museum up in Pewter City, so we decide to head up there. Before we leave though, I press this button under this desk, and this happens. I honestly have no idea what this does, or what this did. I talked to every NPC in the building and interacted with everything that I could, and all of the text was the same. Since we don't yet have Fly, we have to go the long way to Pewter City, which involves going all the way through Mount Moon, However, we did find a helix fossil inside, so it was kinda worth it. We arrive in Pewter City, head into the museum, and unfortunately there's nothing about fossils here. However, if we go around to the back, we can find this old amber, and we get the option to steal it. Now I'm not condoning thefts, but the game then tries to make me feel bad for stealing it, but I got what I wanted, so I don't feel bad whatsoever. Afterwards, we go straight down as south as we can go to Pallet Town, and go even more south towards Cinnabar Island, where we can get this old amber recovered. On the way down, we find this lighthouse, and we head inside, we can find a Jolteon with two Eevees and a Pichu just chilling inside. There isn't really a point to this area, but it is a nice little touch. Once we reach Cinnabar Island, we box Chansey because honestly, it's so bad. It takes forever just for it to be even somewhat usable in battle. I approach the man to resurrect my old Amber but I accidentally gave him the Helix Fossil instead. In this game, you have to wait before your fossil is restored, so now I have to find other stuff to do while this fossil gets restored, before I can even wait for the old Amber to get restored. I then went through this cave slightly south of the island, and it led to the Pokemon Mansion. However, this place just had a couple of items, and nothing else really interesting. After wasting a lot of time in the mansion, I decided to head back to Fuchsia City and buy that house with the backyard that I had mentioned. This place even has its own item storage, which is super helpful because my bag being full makes exploring places a lot less fun. Since since I had no furniture at the moment, other than what the place came with, I couldn't really do much else with the house, so I decided to go train in the Future City Gym. Since Espeon is able to one-shot all of the gym leaders' Pokemon, it makes switch training Dratini really easy. Eventually, Ivan, the fossil restorer, calls and tells us that our fossil has been restored. So we went and claimed our Ammonite and gave him the correct fossil. I instantly boxed Ammonite since I didn't really want it in the first place. Since we still had to wait for our old Amber to be restored, I take the ferry to over to Cyanwood and this random person gives me a shuckle that I instantly threw in the box because I don't want it. I head over to the gym to face off against Chuck, the fighting type gym leader. During one of the battles with the gym trainers, our Dratini evolves into the elegant pink Dragonair. Chuck proceeds to flex his strength by destroying a boulder right in front of us before realizing that we wanted to have a Pokemon battle, not a hand-to-hand -hand combat battle. Chuck leads with his Primeape, and we lead in a Dragonair before switching into Espeon, who one-shots the big monkey man. Chuck then sends out a Chuckle, nice play on words, one shot. But Champ is out next, and we swap in a Dragonair to get some fat XP before switching back into Espeon who gets hit with a Dynamic Punch, confusing it. We hit ourselves the next turn and get brought down to 5 HP, however after a full restore and a Psychic, Machamp goes down. Last out is his Polyrath who suffers the exact same fate as the rest of his team. After receiving our 8th badge, Pokemon League calls us and says we're now eligible to take on the Elite Four, but I personally am not ready for it yet, so we're going to put that on pause for now. Ivan calls and our Fossil is ready. So we head back over to the island, save our game, and start soft resetting for a shiny Aerodactyl, but surprisingly enough, we found a shiny one in less than 5 minutes of hunting. Talk about luck. We received it at level 5, so we're gonna have to spend a good chunk of time training it up to have it keep up with the rest of our team. But since that hunt was so fast, and I was in the mood to do some shiny hunting, I decided to head over to our next target. Also, at some point I just happened to find Fly. I wasn't really paying attention to when this happened, but I did find Fly, so yeah. I taught that to Aerodactyl, and we can finally fly between the regions as we please. We approach the power plant eager to capture our next team member. Inside the plant, I found some stairs that led to a basement with its own unique theme. Was this area originally in Pokemon Crystal? We reached the end of the power plant. 
And there it is, the legendary bird Pokemon, Zapdos. Not only are we going to add Zapdos to our team, but this Zapdos is going to be shiny. You remember how I mentioned at the start of the video that this game has its own shiny hunting method? I'm gonna explain it to you. It is a chaining like method, and basically what you do, you keep killing one species of Pokemon over and over, and your shiny odds increase every five to 10 kills. It does cap at 250, which gives you 10 rerolls, or maxes your odds at about one in 820. See. When you use your dex tracker to start your shiny hunt, its save data is saved somewhere else in the game files, sort of like a hard save. What this means is, I can save the game in front of Zapdos, knock it out, reset the game without saving, and the chain of Zapdos will have started at 1, and the Zapdos will still be there. Every time I knock it out, it will increase by 1. And since I'm not saving the game after I knock it out, the Zapdos will just keep respawning over and over. You can do this for every static Pokemon too, legendary or not, which I think is super cool if you ask me. After I got my chain of Zapdos up to 250, it was just a matter of time. And after a grand total of 50 minutes, we find our shiny legendary Pokemon. And we caught it in our first ball too. This did take 50 minutes, so I left my game open for 50 minutes, allowing the in-game timer to catch up. I head to our nearest Pokemon Center, box Flaffy, and add Zapdos to our team. I then fly to Saffron City, head to the department store, and purchase just plenty of TMs for our team. With Zapdos on our team now, I confidently fly up to Cerulean City and take on Misty's gym. The gym trainers were no match for our legendary friend, and neither was Misty's team of Golduck, Starmie, Quagsire, and Lapras. However, Espeon did help out with Quagsire since it's immune to electric types, given its ground secondary type. But yeah, Zapdos had no problem with this gym battle. Not a single sweat. Time badge is down, and looking at our team, there's clearly an outstander here, Totodile. I really wanted one of these guys, and once I caught him, I never just got around to training him up. And with one of our goals being a full team of shiny Pokemon, I do have to box him. I think about what Pokemon could replace him, and Vaporeon comes to mind, but it's only a 3% encounter chance at the bottom of the Seafoam Islands, or we do another soft reset hunt for the Gift Eevee. I don't really want to do either of those. I was talking to my friend in Discord at the current time trying to figure out what to shiny hunt, and he suggested Politoed, which has a really nice shiny, but I decided I was going to get a Polyrath instead, which has a much less nicer shiny, but it's a part fighting type, so it will give Give us additional coverage. I fly over to Violet Town, surf in this little pond beside the gym, and start killing Poliwags. After committing mass genocide in this pond and reaching 250 kills, I start swimming up and down the pond for a grand total of an hour and 20 minutes, and then we find our shiny Poliwag. Before heading to the Pokemon Center, I surf around the outside of Sprout Tower and notice a side entrance hidden in some trees. When I enter, I can open this gate and I get prompted to steal something from this guy's pocket. I'm not condoning stealing, but we ended up stealing a Rainbow Wing, which is needed to summon the legendary Pokemon Ho-Oh. We then grab Poliwag from the PC and replace Totodile, and I fly back up to Cerulean City to switch train Poliwag and Missy's gym before eventually going down to Fuchsia City to train there instead, since in this gym I can skip all of the gym trainers and go right to fighting the gym leader which would have the strongest Pokemon and therefore give the most XP per battle. After a good training session, Poliwag evolves into Poliwhirl, and even more training later, we go and buy a Water Stone to evolve Poliwhirl into Poliwrath, then fly over to Pewter City to take on the itch gym leader Brock, the rock type user. With our now fully evolved Poliwrath, this gym was a walk in the park. I must admit that Brock had a pretty cool team, leading with Graveler who got one shot by Surf. He then sends out Kabutops, who we take down after a dynamic punch and Surf. He also has a Rhydon, but Rock and Ground is such a bad typing, so Rhydon also gets one shot. Surprisingly, his Onyx hasn't evolved into a Steelix, despite being level 47, which is kind of ridiculous if you ask me. And finally, he sends out his last Pokemon, Omastar. After rematching Brock a couple times to switch train up Aerodactyl, we head to Victory Road where I find three rare candies, which gives us just enough to evolve our Dragonair and a Dragonite. After all this time, switch training it in on almost every battle, it has now become an absolute titan. Now I didn't do a lot of looking into it for this game as I wanted to experience it fresh with no spoilers or anything, so my only knowledge of this game has been what I know from Pokemon Crystal, which I haven't played since it came out in the 3DS, but I'm thinking after about 10 badges, I should be strong enough to take out the Elite Four. Right before we head into challenge them, however, this interviewer stops us in our tracks and challenges us to a battle. Not only did he lead with a green Steelix named Massimo, it's level 56. My Pokemon are only in their high 40s, with two Pokemon not even being level 40 yet. Dragonite thankfully takes down his Steelix, but then he sends out a Scizor named Omega level 63 who sweeps my entire team. I now know that I am nowhere near ready to take on the Elite Four. 
The first thing I do is fly to Goldenrod City to buy another lucky egg from the game corner. I then realize that if I'm going to train my team up, I need to get that last shiny team member. Otherwise, I would just be training up Houndoom for it to eventually get replaced. And then I would have to train up the replacement as well. I spent a lot of time trying to think of a good replacement for Houndoom, but Fire and Dark is such a good type combo and synergizes so well with my team that I decided to just go hunt for a shiny Houndor in Route 7. 40 minutes later, and our Night Pup decides to shine. We replace our Houndoom, who has helped us so much throughout this game, for a new shiny Houndour. I spend the next hour switch training Houndour, who eventually evolves into Houndoom, and then I go and take on Bugsy to earn ourselves another gym badge. But honestly, I did this so I can fight higher level Pokemon in the Fuchsia City gym. Bugsy has a full team of six. This is the first gym leader we faced with six Pokemon. She leads with Butterfree as we lead with Houndoom, who takes it out with a Flamethrower. Then she sends out Sudowoodo, who I always forget is a pure rock type, and he takes down our Houndoom. So we send out a Poliwrath to take down this imposter with a surf. Next up is Scizor, and I send out Aerodactyl to sacrifice so I can safely swap in Zapdos, who takes it down with two Thunderbolts. Pinsir comes out next, but falls to two Drill Packs. I mistakenly swap out Zapdos for Espeon once Heracross comes out, but Espeon held his own. B Drill is out last and falls to a single Drill Pack, and we earn our 11th Gym Badge. I head back to Fuchsia to get right back into level grinding, but I realized that Houndoom basically soloed the entire gym, other than the one mistake I made with Sudowoodo. It would be far more efficient to just let Houndoom run through Bugsy's gym over and over and spend the next 100 minutes just beating the gym down over and over and over with Houndoom and Aerodactyl. Now you may notice that we only have a little bit of time left before taking on the Elite Four, but I did a little bit of research and found that the Elite Four's Pokemon levels skill from the high 60s to low 70s, and we're only at the mid 50s mark. Trying to make the most out of the little bit of time that we have left, I go and take on Price, the Ice type gym leader in Mahogany Town. The last gym battle of the video, his team of six consisted of Sneasel, Cloyster, Pillow Swine, Lapras, Dugong, and even an Articuno. However, all of his Pokemon got one shot. Zapdos, Houndoom, and Aerodactyl made very light work of his team. We earn ourselves the 12th badge with a little over an hour left to spare. What do I decide to do with this last hour? Go shopping, of course. I mentioned this game having its own housing feature, which is more than just being able to buy your own house. Across both regions, there are some places you can go to purchase furniture and other things inside your house. There just happened to be a place here in Mahogany Town known as the Mahogany Bazaar. Here we buy a tropic plant, a gold trophy, a Pikachu themed poster, a bed, and a Wii. After our purchases, I fly right home to check out our new stuff. Overall, it looks nice. I wish I had spent more time focusing on this feature and seeing everything else we could buy, but with only an hour left, all I can do is level grind, which is exactly what I did. Taking on different gyms, leveling up our team, Polyrath would solo Brock's gym till it reached near level 60, Dragonite would take on Erica, the grass gym leader, I also let Houndoom have a go at Erica, and then I hit 24 hours. However, the one flaw with older Pokemon games is the lack of XP share. Because even though many fans don't like the modern XP share, it does save a lot of time. I did spend a good chunk of the 24 hours just grinding against the gym battles, trying to level up our Pokemon high enough so we can actually take on the next challenge, whether it's the next gym leader or the Elite Four. So even though I did hit the 24 hour mark, I decided to keep going, finish grinding until all of our Pokemon were in the mid 60s. I'm going to be taking on the Elite Four with the team on screen now. Espeon, our first Pokemon and our first shiny. Espeon has honestly carried this entire playthrough on his back. Not only was he the very first Pokemon we had received, but most of the training I did in Fuchsia City Gym, I would switch into Espeon to solo the entire gym, hoping the team get to where it's currently at now. Zapdos, our shiny legendary Pokemon, a huge powerhouse. Once we added it to our team, it felt like all of the gym battles would be a breeze. Dragonite, our second ever shiny that was once a level 10 Dratini. This Pokemon saw more action than Espeon honestly, but it didn't get to participate. And now that he's all grown up, he is an absolute powerhouse. Houndoom, the early game carry. Although this isn't the exact Houndoom we used to get through this game, this Pokemon got us almost half of our gym badges, taking down Sabrina, Bugsy, Erica, Morty, and Price. Aerodactyl, although this Pokemon hasn't been used much in battle yet, it's always gotten the job done when it needed a clutch out. It also gave us access to Fly, which is huge. And last but not least, Polyrath, a more recent addition to the team, but the water and fighting type coverage helps us deal with our huge weakness to rock type Pokemon, as well as fire, ground, normal, ice, steel, and dark types. We head back into the Pokemon League and head into the Elite Four, but not before we get stopped yet again by this guy. However, this time we are more than prepared for his team. He leads with Massimo, his green Steelix, and we lead with Polyrath, who one shots it with Surf, 
Next out is X, the blue Alakazam. We switch into Houndoom, but he predicts it and goes for a super effective double kick. However, we tank it and one crunch is more than enough to take it out. He then sends out Neon, the yellow Flareon, and we switch into Polyrath and take a high jump kick. Two surfs later and Neon falls. Next out is Omega, the Scizor. Last time we encountered this Pokemon, we got swept. I switch into Houndoom and he yet again predicts it and hits us with a Karate Chop, taking us to below half health. We don't outspeed, however, and fall before we get the chance to attack. So I send out Polyrath once more, use Hypnosis, and two surfs later, Omega is down. A red and yellow Tentacruel is out next named Launcher. But we stay in, hit it with an Earthquake, almost taking it down in one shot. However, before we can finish it off, Polyrath falls. I send out Dragonite to finish the job, and he does just that. The interviewer sends out his final Pokemon, Treble, which is a purplish Umbreon that is a toxic staller with leftovers. We do eventually take it out, but damn, this thing was annoying. After the battle, the receptionist heals our Pokemon, and we enter the Elite Four, where we see a completely unique cutscene with all of the Elite Four trainers we will be facing off against. Our first battle is against Rowan, who leads with Tangela as we lead with Dragonite, who one-shots it with Ice Beam. Next out is Starmie, and I switch into Houndoom predicting an Ice Beam, who takes it out with a Crunch. Then Rowan sends out Wigglytuff, who takes us below half health from a Hyper Beam, but two Crunches was enough to take it out. Nidoqueen is out next, and we swap into Dragonite predicting an Earthquake. We use Ice Beam and get the Freeze off, which gives us our next turn for free. Taking it out, and last comes out Raichu, and I suddenly realize that I actually don't have a good answer for Electro-type Pokemon, since both of my Pokemon who know Earthquake also happen to be weak to Electro-types. We use Outrage, which does about 50%, before almost getting knocked out with a Crit Thunder, but Dragonite hangs on, and Raichu goes down the next turn. After claiming our first victory, we enter the next room, and I notice two pond-looking things, and I try to fish there. Funny enough, we fish up a Pokemon, but it was just a level 7 Magikarp. We wake up the old man from his slumber and he leads with Noctile, but we yet again leave with Dragonite, so one Ice Beam is all it takes. He sends out Octillery next, so I switch into Zapdos, hoping to tank an Ice Beam, and we do, but then we miss the next three Zap Cannons. Come on Zapdos. I swap into Houndoom and go for Solar Beam, which doesn't need to charge because this battle has permanent sunlight. He sends out a shiny Ammonite next. I'm not sure why this isn't evolved, but okay. And Zatu comes out next, who gets one shot by Crunch. And last out is Beedrill, who gets one shot by Flamethrower. When I read online that the levels were near 70, I assumed it was all of the Pokemon and not just their ace Pokemon being like 6 to 8 levels above the rest of their team, but a win is a win, I guess. We enter the next room, where there are a bunch of video game consoles everywhere. And this room's theme is actually the cave level theme from Super Mario Bros, which is pretty cool. When we talk to this guy, part of his dialogue is him calling me out for playing on an emulator, which I found hilarious. We lead with Aerodactyl, and he leads with an Alakazam named Anderson, so we switch into Houndoom predicting a Psychic. Next out is Forden the Magmar, so we swap back into Aerodactyl, who one-shots it with Ancient Power. Then comes out Charvo the Porygon 2, we swap into Polyrath, but he goes for a Zap Cannon, which is super effective, and also paralyzes us. He hits us with another one, and we get fully paralyzed. He hits us with another one, but we hang on with a Focus Sash, we get fully paralyzed again, and go down to yet another Zap Cannon. I switch into Espeon, and go for Psychic doing about 70% before getting hit with a Crit from Zap Cannon, which paralyzes us, and we get fully paralyzed the next turn. Following turn, I go for quick attack and we get fully paralyzed again. Quick recap. We get fully paralyzed four times in a row. This Porygon hits all five of its zap cannons without missing once and we got hit with a critical hit. Someone please comment what the odds of this happening are because that's just crazy. We send out Dragonite to handle this thing and Waterfall takes it out. Next out is Dog Pound the Houndoom who goes down to two waterfalls. Last out is a shiny Togepi. Am I in the right room? Is this the Elite Four? The strongest trainers in both of the regions? We go for Outrage and it lives. This Togepi is buff. Next turn it does fall however. That is three Elite Four members down, with only one more to go, plus the champion. We face off against the last Elite Four member Honeybun, who leads with Gengar. Fortunately for us, we led with Aerodactyl. This thing is level 62, which is nice to see because it means levels will be balanced for this battle. We Oko it with an Earthquake, and Steelix comes out next. We switch into Polyrath, and it sets up with Curse before getting one shot by Surf. Honeybun sends out their own Dragonite, and we miss our first Hypnosis and eat a Thunder before putting it to sleep next turn so we can safely swap 
into our own Dragonite and take it out with an Ice Beam. Next up is Slowbro, and I switch into Houndoom as it misses a Thunder Wave. We almost one-shot it with Crunch, and then get one-shot by Surf. Zapdos comes out and cleans it up with a Thunderbolt. Next out is Daddy? The Snorlax. So we swap back into Poliwrath, hoping it'll take care of it with a couple dynamic punches, but it does eventually fall. Aerodactyl, however, comes out and finishes the job. His last Pokemon is a Heracross with a question mark at the end of its name, and we one-shot it with Fly. Why does it have a question mark? We have defeated the Elite Four. What we have to do is take on the champion, Shock Slayer, the creator of this game. He leads with Sandorf the Tyranitar, and we go for an Earthquake, hoping that's enough to take it out, but it just barely survives. We get hit with a Rock Slide and also just barely survive. Since we outspeed, we take it out next turn, and he sends out a shiny electrode named Flashman who takes us out. We send out Espeon who tanks a Thunderbolt before taking it out with a Psychic. He sends out an Espeon of his known named Deca Dandy. This Espeon is golden. We one shot it with a Shadow Ball, however. That Espeon looks amazing. Next out is Maelstrom, the yellowish Vaporeon. We switch into Zapdos, who misses both of its Zap Cannons and gets taken out by a Crit Surf. You've done nothing this entire Elite Four run, bro. I swap into Houndoom, thinking that this weather is Sun and I go for Solar Beam, but I then remember it's a Sandstorm and one Surf was enough to take us out. Next, I send out Poliwrath and put it to sleep with Hypnosis, and eventually we take it out with some Earthquakes. Next out is his shiny Skarmory named Top Lettuce at level 70. It takes out both Poliwrath and Espeon, and and Dragonite is our last hope. We trade blows, and it eventually goes down to an Ice Beam, and the champion sends out his last Pokemon Saber, the black and purple Caesar. We go for Waterfall, and it goes for Substitute. It's going to stall us with Sandstorm. We hit another Waterfall, destroying its sub, and it hits us with a Steel Wing, taking us out. I actually lost, and truthfully, I'm happy, because it means Elite Four is actually challenging in this game. I strongly believe that Zapdos missing both of its Zap Cannons 100% sold the battle, but we aren't ending on a loss. I run through the Elite Four once more, and we reach Shock Slayer once again. This time, I lead with Polygrath against Tyranitar and one-shot it with a Dynamic Punch. Electrode is out, and we let it take us down so we can safely switch into Aerodactyl, who actually outspeeds one of the fastest Pokemon and one-shots it with Earthquake. Vaporeon comes out, and you think it would take us down, so we start to chip it with Agent Power, and it goes for Acid Armor. We hit another Ancient Power, and it goes for Toxic but misses. And the third Ancient Power is enough to take it down. All it needed was to hit one Surf? That's Pokemon AI, I guess. Scizor comes out next, and takes an Earthquake before setting up Substitute. We take that out the next turn and hits us with a Steel Wing, but we live in the red, so we go for another Earthquake, P enough to where Substitute fails, and one more Earthquake is all it takes to take out Scizor. Next out is the Golden Espeon, and I go for Fly, which is a two-turn attack, making sure that Espeon takes a little bit more chip damage from the Sandstorm. We eventually fall and send out our own Espeon to clean it up with a Shadow Ball, and last out is Top Lettuce the Skarmory. I drop it down to about 50% HP before our own Espeon goes down, down, but Houndoom comes out and takes it out with a flamethrower. It's crazy how differently this battle played compared to the last one. It was barely even close. We've won the battle, and right before we can head into the Hall of Fame, we get attacked by a level 70 shiny swineup. We try to catch it, and it says it's impossible to hit because of its speed. So Zapdos takes it out. Turns out, it was actually Shock Slayer's Pokemon. We register ourselves as the newest champion and see the text, The winds of change have blown across the land. And we just get kicked out. Nothing else happens. However, I wonder what the winds of change have done to the region. Unfortunately, this is where the video ends. I did have a lot of fun playing through this ROM hack. However, there's still so much more we can do in this game. If you guys want to see a part two, drop a like and leave a comment down below. Let me know if that's something you guys would like to see, because I'd absolutely love to do a part two of this game. Really quickly before this video ends, I do have something I'd like to tell you guys. So both on YouTube and Twitter, I posted a poll regarding streaming, and I briefly mentioned it at the end of the previous video, and a lot of you guys said you would be interested in watching me stream. Stream. Due to the insane amount of support on the custom shiny video for Omega Ruby, I've decided that for the next video, a similar playthrough, but in the Alola region instead. Rather than just recording it though, I'm going to be streaming it live on Twitch every other day. The link will be in the description as well as a little bit more information on the subject. If that is something that interests you, I would greatly appreciate a follow over there as I am super excited to start streaming. And with all of that being said, I'd like to thank you guys for watching this video. I hope you all enjoyed and I'll see you in the next one.